hi to those who just joined. So, um, like I was saying, last week we looked at features and we looked at them in detail. Features can also be called benchmarks. Why do we do features? Uh, features have two purposes. The first is that a feature is a mini brand. Okay, so a feature is also a benchmark and it's something that happens at the same time, either daily or weekly. What is the purpose of a feature? To create a mini brand. So a feature should be strong enough to stand on its own. If you can take it outside of that show, it would still be um, known. You would still know what it is if you heard the name. And then the second reason for a feature, the second purpose of a feature is to drive time spent listening. So TSL, which is important for us because that drives our, our ratings because we, um, when we do RAM diaries, we do them in 15 minute increments. So we want to get you to listen longer, okay? Remember the number one rule of radio is to get a listener to listen for longer. So how do you do that? You increase, well, you have brilliant audio and content, which will then increase their time, time spent listening from one of these increments to the next one, which will then increase our ratings at the end of the day. So we said a feature um, is kind of like the outside stays the same. So the name of the feature will stay the same on a weekly basis. The content within the name of that feature will change on a weekly basis, obviously. Okay. So a feature for it to be successful needs to be fun to do, and fun to listen to. It needs to have longev longevity and sustainability. So you need to have enough content to have that feature running for a year but also the content needs to be interesting and relatable and uh, relative and entertaining enough that you can um, keep your listeners for that year listening to the specific feature. So um, look for things like games or informational pieces or funny content pieces that are based around storytelling, not in the sense that you know storytelling as, but in the sense of we might, we might use a... Um, a hook and a payoff, uh, and there will be some crumbs in between. So it's not necessarily the full thing. It might not necessarily be as easy to point out, but we still make use of some of the elements of storytelling. Be careful not to have only features on your show because then there's no unpredictability. It's just we know everything that's happening. So we try to keep a balance between consistency and unpredictability. What we do is we have what we call open features in between. So these open features are where we don't tell you what to talk about. You can talk about anything that's happening right now that's very relatable and relevant and um, necessary to speak about perhaps or entertaining within those open features. So there's a checklist of questions to help spark your creativity on features. And that was firstly to check your prep sheets of the previous days. Sometimes we had great callers on the air that we can bring back okay, to help us create content. Then you need to understand your audience. You need to know what they find topical, what is relevant to them and what is local to them, what is stuff that they will find interesting and relate to. So next, ask your members of your team or ask the people around you what is going on in their lives. We forget that the people that work with us are also human beings. They also go through things. Things also happen to them. And sometimes some of those personal stories will relate to your listeners and they could work very well on air. So make use of that. Um, then we create what we call a clash of context. So we take someone out of their comfort zone and we put them in a situation that might make them feel a bit more uncomfortable. And then we exaggerate that for comedic effect. Okay, So we place them in a situation where they normally wouldn't be and we exaggerate that situation. So then there are multiple opportunities for interesting stories and features. Um, so try to do some of the following. Set up, but also revolve conflicts. Think, think about how it feels when load shedding kicks in and you were watching a series and just before you found out what happened, so in the crux of the story, the power goes off. It's very frustrating, okay, aggravating. So if you set up conflict, you have to resolve it, okay? That resolution is extremely important. Address or create dilemmas. Resolve something with an interactive topic. So something like ask a man, 
they give you a scenario of a situation that they placed in and then they give you resolutions okay go on a quest or a mission there are loads of lots of those type of features write a comedy sketch or create a top five list of a topical story but then you need to make it personable you need to bring in something why are you doing that specific feature um <clears throat> what are you talking about within this feature that is going to be relevant to your listener or introduce a new interactive game or include audio in most of your content segments so last week in class i played three different context seg content segments one was a talk show piece the other one was a piece from uh, a prank call, so humoristic piece from Dar uh, Wackhead Simpson. And then the last one was an Ask a Man feature. And all three of those contained audio used in different ways. The one cut it up into short little pieces of content used as crumbs throughout the story uh, or the segment. The second one had one long storytelling element where the a lady who was on air told us her sad story about her boyfriend. And then the last one, it was more interactive between the dad and the son, okay, with Darren or Wackhead coming in every now and then, talking a little bit. Um, so it audio gets used in different ways to create this whole entertaining factor. And also to create that emotiveness. Remember that emotiveness is still extremely important, even in a feature. In fact, the features that do the best are the ones that bring out this emotiveness in us. It makes us laugh or it makes us think or it makes us feel sorry for someone. It brings out something or intrigue. Then book a guest who's relevant on the audience or the show. The thing to remember here is for a guest to be relevant does not necessarily mean it's the person that only you want to interview. So if your favorite celebs come, celeb comes to South Africa, does that automatically mean that you need to interview this person on air? No, it doesn't. Okay. Just because this person is your favorite celeb doesn't mean that they're doing anything relevant or relatable right now, because you also need to take into consideration your audience. So let's say your favorite celeb of all times is a 60-year-old musician who isn't making music anymore, but used to make a lot of music. Um, so he used to be extremely well known. Nowadays, he's just still there. Um, and you are on a on YFM, so an urban youth radio station. That person will not fit there at all, okay, under any circumstances. So you will not interview that person um, because it won't work on the show. So always remember, if you get a guest on your show, it needs to make the show sound better and it needs to be relevant. Uh, to your audience. Then book an expert to shed light on an issue. But keep in mind, look for personality experts. So it shouldn't only be someone who is an expert in, I don't know, flowers. It needs to be someone who is also well-spoken, someone who is entertaining, who can tell a story, who is articulate, okay, that we can listen to. Because unfortunately, a lot of people are experts, yes, book experts, but it doesn't mean they're very good with uh, bringing across the content. So they're not necessarily very coherent or they might stutter or stumble over their words when talking to you. OK, so keep in mind, look for personality. And the last one is to create a viral video. So whatever content you are creating, that is the dress up that we always ask you about or talk about. What are you doing to make this content bigger, better, um, getting it to go viral, getting it to become one of those did you hear moments? Okay, that's what you need to keep in mind there. Right. So that was just like I said at the recap there from what we spoke about last week. So keeping that kind of content in mind, now we are looking at performance and formatics from Valerie Geller's textbook. So we're looking at chapter six, page 45 to 64 of performance and formatics. So remember theater of the mind. Radio is seen as theater of the mind, which means we need to create stories in pictures. We tell a story for you, utilizing your imagination. So radio communication utilizes theater of the mind and the people on the radio needs to talk, need to talk in pictures. 
The same principle applies to all material written and produced for on-air on use as well. There are two quotes in your textbook, which I really like. The first is, to escape criticism, do nothing, say nothing, be nothing. Okay? So that means the only way that you will never be criticized is not to achieve anything in life. And then the second quote says, if you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. So interesting quotes there. All right. So when we speak about performance, what does that mean? It comes back to it doesn't matter how great your content is. If your performance is not up to standard, your content is going to sound poor automatically. Remember this for your recordings, for your lecture, uh, for your assignment. Doesn't matter how great your content is. If your performance lacks, the overall piece will be seen as lackluster, as not up to par. When you listen to radio, you will hear two types of people. The type of person that sounds spontaneous, um, comfortable, easy to listen to, natural, like they can just talk. Then you get the type of person who might sound like they are nervous, like they're uncomfortable, they might be pained, or it might sound unnatural to you on air, it might sound like they're reading. That's the two type of people on air. And they make you feel a little bit awkward because you can hear it doesn't come so easy to them, so you might switch over easily. We want to get you to the point to be this natural sounding, spontaneous sounding personality. But it takes years of practice and hard work to get to this point where you can call yourself a seasoned professional, um, where you sound like you're in control of your show, no matter what, at any situation. That takes practice. So you need to practice, okay? Even for your assignments, you need to practice. Don't only record something once. Record it two times. Record it three times. Listen back to it. Listen to what it sounds like to you. Air check yourself to hear what works, what doesn't work. <clears throat> so it is a skill, luckily, that you can learn. It just, like I said, it takes time, but you can learn it, okay? And there are a few basic performance points that we're going to look at now that can assist you in getting to this point where you sound easy, natural, like you are a great, spontaneous, in-control presenter, no matter what. So the first one there is... Pick topics that you really care about. If you, if you are a really great presenter, it doesn't really matter what you talk about. You can make anything sound interesting. But to start, make sure that you are interested in whatever it is that you are talking about on air. Okay? Because if you are interested, you will be interesting because of the passion that you might have for it. Okay? Very important, if you are interested in something, you will make it sound interesting. The same is true of the opposite. If you are not interested in what you're talk talking about, if you sound bored, you will sound boring to the listener, okay? The, the listener is going to find you uh, boring and stop listening. They will tune out. Number two, use a strong show opening or a monologue. So the hook. What is your hook of your link? What are you doing? Okay, don't read entire prepared speeches, please. If you must read on air, don't make it sound like you are reading. That is also a skill that comes with time. But the biggest thing with that is monotony. So if you read immediately, let me just read something. So a great talent or personality can make selecting a sofa interesting. Boring people, on the other hand, could ruin a conversation about the discovery of the human life on Pluto. That is reading on air. That's what it'll sound like. It sounds monotonous. That's not what you want to be ever on air. Okay. So if you have to read, don't make it sound like you are reading. Then read it in the same way that you would have read one of your speeches in school. So not standing here like this. Okay. Number three, never be boring, obviously, like I just said. Get rid of dull guests on air immediately. Because if you're bored, again, it's going to sound boring. Um, there's this big thing where people are super scared of being rude on air. Okay, It's been so drilled into us not to be rude. 
to the extent that we're actually being rude to our listeners. Because as much as we don't want to offend one person um, who's on air with us, we are offending everyone else off air by giving them boring content. And then they're going to switch off. If a guest starts out great, but in fact turns out to be too nervous to really do a good interview or to be a good storyteller, get rid of them. Get rid of them immediately. The last thing you should be doing is looking at your watch while you have a present or um, a guest in studio, okay? Because if you are looking at your watch, I can guarantee you, you've lost quite a few of listeners already because you have to be there. You are working. They don't have to be there. Okay? So if you struggle with simply cutting someone off, try other techniques, like try to ask different types of questions, something that can raise the energy within your room, okay? Something that might get that person to open up or sound more interesting because obviously you've prepped for this segment. If this, is a, if this doesn't work either and you have a problem dismissing a guest, then make an arrangement beforehand with your producer or with the news presenter or the traffic person, whoever it is, to come into studio and to assist. They could be walking past just waving a copy of like news and things. And then you go, oh, cool, we have to cut it short or we have to cut, okay, uh, to get them out of studio. So you don't have to be seen as like the, the bad guy in the scenario. Remember at the end of the day, you are the, the, the personality on air. So you are probably way more interesting than the guest in studio. You can talk. You can keep on talking. Okay. Be flexible and remember to protect your on-air product. That product is worth a lot of money, literally. Um, and every second someone else is talking and helping you, well, making the station lose monetary value isn't good for you. And monetary value they lose because they lose listeners. So make sure that you protect that. But on the other side, if the guests are great, keep them. Talk to them longer. If they are creating great, entertaining audio, keep talking. Number four there, don't take calls just because they are there. Guests are not there for you to simply, or uh, callers are not simply there for you only to put them on air because you can. Not under any circumstances is that the fact, okay? What should happen on air is that a call, any, any call that you put on air should be making the content sound better. If they are not making a contribution to your show, to making the show more interesting uh, by being engaging or by telling a story or by being relevant and relatable and entertaining, why on earth did you put them on air? Why are they there? Okay, they shouldn't be there then. Then you can just as well talk. Remember again, we start listening to radio because of the music, but we stay because of the personalities. We stay for the people. So you want to, to keep that in mind. We also get people that are so good at telling stories and great at talking that five minutes seems like five seconds. And then we get the reverse where five seconds seems like five minutes. Those ones you cut, you get them off air immediately. Then number five, what if the interview or the topic goes wrong? Don't be afraid to reset, okay, when you go in or come out of a break. So sometimes you might have asked a wrong question. You don't frame your talkable topic or your engaging question well. So if you're not getting the desired response from your interviewee, perhaps it's time to change the story or the example that you are using or to recompose the question to engage the audience differently. So don't be afraid to reset a topic going into or coming out of a break. Um, but don't repeat the topic exactly. Make the changes that you feel need to be made. Add something new. So you can always do this. It's like when you ask me a question and I explain something and you still don't understand and I need to reset. So I need to rephrase it in a different way to get you to actually understand what it is that I'm teaching you. It's the same way on air. Okay? If you're not getting a response, change. Day number six, you are allowed to change your mind. Just because you've made an opinion, you've made a statement, doesn't mean that you couldn't have gathered other facts or information to change your mind, okay? So sometimes your opinion would change. So views may change as an issue evolves over days or over weeks. Um, and in this case, don't be afraid to change your mind as more facts become available or, or if a caller or a guest persuades you of their viewpoint, okay? If they had a very strong argument, 
don't stick to your guns if you are wrong. If you, um, if you are wrong, admit it. Remember to tell the truth. So you can always admit, or rather you should always admit if you don't know something. Just because you're on radio doesn't mean that you should know everything about everything that there is, okay? It's impossible. You're not expected to have all the facts uh, about all the issues all the time. And then take a risk. Sometimes when you head into a danger zone with a comment or a view or a question or a decision that you make on air, it might be good to go with it, okay? So to take that risk on air. Understand that not everything you say will, it will be popular. That's impossible. Even if you feel like it's true, you must still say what you, if you have an unpopular viewpoint, still make that viewpoint. How far can you push things on air? How far can you take it? A lot of that is going to depend on your relationship with your management. Even more than that depends on your level of success. So if you are if you are the breakfast presenter, you're going to be able to get away with more than your Saturday evening presenter will be able to because of your success rates. Uh, proven personalities can get away with a lot more than unproven talents or new arrivals to shows. So if you know that you're going into a controversial or gray area, if you know this beforehand as well, sometimes it's better to ask permission from your manager first, okay, before doing it. A powerful show is not one where the host lives in fear of getting uh, fired because then you're always going to be treading on eggshells and your content is going to come across as lackluster. If you ever become a manager, keep in mind that when your talent phones you, when a presenter phones you to ask whether they can or can't, dump, can't do something in on a potentially dangerous subject, you need to make a decision. You need to decide whether they can or can't. That's your job. Sometimes you might need to take a moment to consult, consult with a lawyer, okay? Especially if it's a big commercial radio station and it is a gray area. <clears throat> so then you ask, you get a, a second opinion. Is it really better to ask for forgiveness than to ask for, for, for permission? I know people love saying it's better to ask um, or to say sorry afterwards than ask beforehand, but that's not always the case, right? That is going to depend. Trust your instincts, trust your gut feelings, but also try not to hold yourself back from potentially powerful radio moments. So don't be so afraid of failure or of getting into trouble that you lose your sense of spontaneity or your sense of discovery, because that's one of the reasons why the station would have taken you in in the first place, okay? Why you're a presenter there. So live radio is a live experience. Sometimes it does mean gray areas and it does mean saying sorry afterwards. But again, just take every topic as it comes individually, taking into consideration the potential flack you might get afterwards. So there has been radio presenters like this on air that did not ask permission before. And that's people like, for instance, Howard Stern. So his broadcast executive, Mel Karmazin, always backed Howard, no matter what happened. So when they worked together at CBS Radio, uh, no matter what Stern said, if he crossed the line and got the network into trouble, Mel literally paid the penalty fees at all times. As a manager, Mel believed in Howard so much and he obviously liked the profits that was coming in because a lot of money was made through Howard Stern. Um, so he would rather keep the talent and pay the fines and keep getting the money in. He understood that talent, talent cannot be restricted. You can't restrict great radio personalities. If you want great mo moments, you have to assume some risk, okay, from time to time. So that is one of those things we simply need to take into consideration. Number eight there then. Use your off switch. That's a big one. What does that mean? It means know when to stop talking. Know when to switch off the microphone, but know when to switch off, okay? Know when you're, when you're done, when your uh, piece is finished. So master the use of the, the most difficult piece of equipment in the control room, which is your microphone. Practice moderation. 
learn to recognize when a bit is over and start, stop talking at that point. Many a times I listen to great moments on air um, that you can hear us prepped, but then they don't know how to get out of the link. They don't know when to stop talking, so they keep on babbling afterwards. That's why it's so important, and I always keep hammering on when you start prepping your piece, start by prepping the payoff. Prep your payoff. Know how this link is going to end and when you're getting out of it. We've previously said it, but let's say you have a caller on the line. As soon as the caller has made the payoff, as soon as they, they've said the resolution, what they were there to say, you switch off the microphone. Done. Okay, out of that link. Move on to the next one then. And some days you won't have the best show of your life. There will be days where you might not have given your base for some reason or you have an off show. So what do you do then? Lie in bed and cry about it. Um, hopefully not, because not every show can be your best show. Even your favorite personalities will have an occasional bad day. Okay, It's one of those things that happens. It's about how you handle it. Sometimes your rhythm might just be off simply, or you might not be feeling well. You might be a bit sick, whatever it is. So when you had that show that didn't work, it's important that you do a quick analysis of the show. So look for easy identifiable reasons as to what might have gone wrong. Perhaps you didn't get enough, enough sleep or you were hungry or the show prep was simply inadequate. Or perhaps you had a fight or something happened in your personal life. If it's fixable, fix it and do it differently next time. Okay. Perhaps you simply did a poor job that day. It also can happen. So there are two things you can do then. You can choose to pick it apart over and over and beat yourself up with air check, making yourself feel terrible the whole time, thereby, they, thereby probably ensuring you are going to do a worse job the next day, right? Or you can let it go. Your regular listeners will forgive you and will be back tomorrow. And... Um, Someone might be listening to tomorrow who's never heard you before, so they don't even know you had a bad show the previous day. Okay, forgive yourself and move forward. Then the last one is treat your staff with respect. Treat the people that you work with with respect. Okay, whether you know it or not, um, they can have a lot of impact on your performance. The station staff can help you or they can sabotage you in a million different ways. A miserable team can cost you more than you think it will. So that's from a uh, formatics and a performance point of view. Things that you should be keeping, or oh, that's more from a <clears throat> performance though, point of view, things that you should keep in mind with how you should be sounding on air. Then when we get to formatics, formatics are not the easiest thing in the world for creative people to accept. It's not something they uh, all tend to like to do. And they might find that it, it <clears throat> restricts them somehow. But people like structure. People like to know to whom they are listening. They like to know what the song was that just played. Okay. We want to know more details. It's for you to figure out how to do these within the confines of your formatics. Same thing with your uh, recordings that you need to do for me. You have to utilize the Mexican on the bicycle wheel. It's just about how you utilize it. So you know there are certain objectives you need to do regardless. Figure out what is the most creative way you can make it work for you. How can you use formatics to get those extra five minutes from your listeners? What you do is you start by inviting your listeners in. Okay, You get them to want to stay listening to you. So if you can get your listeners to listen to an extra five minutes, you are moving in a very positive direction. Because if they will stay an extra five minutes every single day, that's already an extra 25 minutes that they've been listening to you. How do we do this? We invite them and we invite them like we mean it. So you need to make it sound like you are sincere. Invite them only five minutes ahead. Okay, don't invite them half an hour beforehand. Invite them five minutes be before the, your next content piece. Don't do the full reveal. You hook them. You give them mini crumbs. You give them reasons to keep listening. You give them mini payoffs, but you don't give away everything because they're not going to keep on listening to you then because 
the resolution has been given to them. Remember, everyone wants that resolution. So don't give the resolution to them here. So do a promise link and keep something in your sleeve or up your sleeve rather by um, utilizing this hook and then doing your performance where you give them what they want to hear. Invite them frequently. So don't uh, invite only once. So invite them at the top of the hour. Invite them right before news so that they know what will be coming up after news. As soon as you change topics or as soon as you switch to something new, invite the audience to stay. Tell them why it's going to be good. Why what will be coming up, up will be of value to them. Okay, your promise again. As you go into a song, because not everyone might like the specific song that's coming up now, invite them to listen to what will be coming up after the song. Do a promise once again. Prior to your next guest, invite the audience to listen in or to join in. Do another promise link there. Okay, so we do quite a few promises throughout the show. So this is what we call appointment listening. Think again of in features we also spoke about appointment listening, time spent listening. This is when you make an appointment to listen to something specific on the radio. So it's one of those we know it's part of our daytime uh, routine that we want to listen to this thing. <clears throat> so if you want to uh, invite your listeners more than five minutes ahead of time, that forms part of your appointment listening to something big that might be coming up. And this appointment listening increases your station's uh, ratings, but you can't do this with everything. Pick a certain show or a certain feature, something specific um, that they would want to hear. Also tell them the specific time. Don't be vague. Tell them that at a half past this will be coming up. They need to know exactly when they can hear something um, because then they might make the effort. Okay, research even supports the specific technique and it's easy to do. Then uh, if you download a podcast or you watch a YouTube video or even, I don't know, a series, you no longer have to come in during the middle of a show. You can digitally start at the beginning. I mean, when we watch a series, we don't start it at the middle. It's not live. Um, we can start it from the beginning, right? Live radio, however, is still the one place where you join the action in progress. So keep that in mind. It's important that listeners feel that they can join an in at any time and always be invited into your program and always still know what is going on. So imagine a third person joins you and you were deep in conversation with someone about something and you don't explain to them what you're talking about. They're going to tune out. Same on air. Okay, you need to tell them what you're talking about, but also invite them. So make them feel like you want them there. Okay. Then overcoming resistance. Programmers around the world share a common frustration and ask the same question of talent. And that is, why don't you simply do the formatics as you are told? <laughs> How hard can it be? We've talked about this. I mean, you only have to say the song's name or your name or the station's name or the show's name, okay? Give the time. Um, it's not that difficult. So why is it that people have such resistance to doing formatics? Because they don't understand it, okay? They might not understand why they are doing formatics. They don't understand that what is in it at the end of the day is that your listeners want that information. We want to know who is talking right now on air because I don't recognize that voice. What is this show? I, um, I really like this show. I want to come back to listen to it. Or what is the song that just played? I just, um, I really, really, really love it. And I have no way of finding it right now. So give me the name of that song, okay? So why rebel with formatics or forget to do them? The reason is that many on-air personalities don't believe it's important uh, because they already know who they are and where they work. They know this, remember? Um, it becomes boring to them to repeat their name and the station's dial positions and call letters. So that's the frequency and the name of the station. If you don't understand exactly why you are doing formatics, it's not going to be a priority to you. Same with Mexican on the Bicycle. It's exactly that. 
If you don't understand your obligations, it's not going to be a priority for you to do. You can't simply keep doing something just because someone told you to do it. Okay, You need to understand the why behind it. It's always important to ask as well to make sure that you understand something. So you need to understand like that people want to know who is this person? Who is he talking to? Then you'll need to, if, you, if you've ever asked that question when you were listening to the radio, you will understand the importance of resetting content, of um, how important formatics overall are. Okay. Also, repetitiveness for research. Um, the more you say the dial tones and the name of the station, the quicker someone will remember them. And once they do diaries and do um, need to tell you, tell what stations they were listening to, they can recall it. Okay, so it's also for recall to drive recall to get you to remember that you are listening to the station. So that's another reason why it's important. Uh, oops, um, give credit where credit is due. So it's assumed that people are familiar with the radio station, but that's not the case. Most of their actual listener, most most of the radio station's actual listeners might not hear the name and the dial tone of a radio station that regularly. Okay, so they will have trouble remembering it or remembering where they were tuned in. Repetition is a way that we learn and the way that we memorize it. So repeat formatics over and over and over again until the audience knows your details and the radio station shows details. So uh, be, re be responsible for helping to eliminate that ratings term phantom cue. So what is phantom cue? Phantom cue refers to the cumulative audience that we lose when we do RAM diaries. So why do we lose audiences in RAM diaries? or while we do RAM diaries, because they don't remember that they were listening to this specific radio station. They don't remember the frequency of this radio station. So what happens is your audience figures might be a lot higher than it actually is. But because people don't remember listening to you when they are filling in these RAM diaries, automatically you lose them as listeners. Um, so your phantom cue might be like 2%, which is a lot if you look at 2% of, let's say, Ukwazi FM 7.9 million, okay, which could then actually make, put you in a lot higher a class with uh, listenership figures. So that's phantom cum. So obviously phantom not being real, um, cum, cumulative audience. So phantom cum is the amount of listeners, listeners of your station, but they are not seen as real listeners of your station because they have not been counted in your RAM diaries because they forgot who they were listening to. Um, then we look at a couple of formatics tips. So every single radio station will have a slightly different structure to them, but they all have one thing in common. And that is that your listener should never feel the pressure that you feel to execute formatics correctly. For them, it should simply happen. It should be simply something that you talk about, something that you say. So if your station is using a, a recall method specifically for ratings, then every 15 minutes you are judged by what the diary keepers write down. So people who do RAM, RAM diaries, what do they write down? What do they say over the phone? This means that every 15 minutes you need to make sure that you say your name, the name of the show, the name of the station, the frequency of your radio station. So this is where repetition comes in. I don't know if you ever watched Sesame Street, but think of Sesame Street here. Repeat and repeat and repeat until the audience learns it. Okay. When you sit and you are busy with these performance, don't use radio speak. Okay. Stay away from talking in radio. What does that mean? What does it mean to talk in radio speak? It means don't use words and phrases that you say only when you're in front of a microphone. So something like segment or this program or forecast or link. Okay. Stay away from that kind of words. So don't use any radio slang on air because your listener has absolutely no idea what you are talking about. Um, try to keep your formatic sounding as natural as possible. 
always answer the question, why should my listeners listen to this? Why should someone listen to this? I only mention the clock if there is a benefit to the listener. Okay. Otherwise, you also don't mention the clock and uh, the clock formatics within it. If you say something like, here's your traffic on the eights, it might be helpful because the audience needs to know that you are keeping your promise to bring them the traffic every 10 minutes, but rather say, here's your traffic at eight. Okay. When it comes to the time, try to stay away from saying things like, it's just gone 19 minutes past one here on whatever the station's name is. Because if I ask you the time in real life, what will you tell me? You're going to say it's almost 20 past, it's almost 20 past one. That's what, we, what you'll say to me. That's how we speak. So speak the same way on air as you do as um, when you're talking one on one with someone. Okay. Listeners care only about what is interesting or relevant to them. So don't talk about the rest because they don't care about the rest. Formatics don't have to be dry and boring. Um, if you do them well, they can become a very creative and exciting part of your show. So you need to put some work into it. That's how that happens. Okay. Pull a listener into the radio with you. So avoid saying anything that pushes a listener away. So don't tell a listener that you're in a different room than they are. Make them feel like you are right here with them, that they are sitting in front of you, okay? There's no distance between us. You're not here in studio where it's nice and warm and you know that over there in Joburg South, it's extremely cold right now. You must be in the same areas. Always sell the benefit of a show or a station. What is the benefit in it for me? What is in it for me? Why am I listening to it? And then use real language. Talk on the air the same way that you talk in real life, okay, like I said. So when we look at talk formatics on page 57 in Valerie Giller's textbook, open the hour with your name, the time, the call letters. Again, the call letters is your frequency name. So in America, um, in the USA, they would have something like, I don't know, FMR or XLR, whatever it is, as their uh, call letters. So we have station names. Uh, do a short opening comment. If you have any in that day, which may or may not be your main topic, launch into your monologue. So engage the audience with your opinion, your position and storytelling. Ask the question. This is your tightly focused topic. Give out phone numbers. Take a break. We're going to talk about that now, though. Using proper formatics. Use the term up next. Never use the term take a break. Um, why don't we use the term take a break? Because take a break is television talk, okay? It's used on TV to physically take a break and go away from the show. If you're telling a listener on air that you're going to go and take a break, it gives them the impression that you're going away. So they might go away. So we don't speak about taking a break. We say up next. Then open the phones uh, after your first break. So get the calls in because remember, this is talk radio once again. And then reset your topic. How do you do that? You ask the questions uh, going in and out of each break. Again, use, using proper formatics. Connect with your listeners. Tell me, don't read to me. Um, you're not going to connect with me if you are reading your piece of content. content. Um, let your language and the manner pull uh, your listener in. Then the rule of one. Do one main thing per break. Again, Mexican on the bicycle, stick to one thought per length. Same with advertising, we stick to one thought per advert. Don't do more than that because you might confuse your listener. Hit the target. So many stations find it helpful to have an idea, a specific profile of the listener, complete with a picture if possible. And they post this on the next to the on-air studio or behind the microphone. And then that's the person that you talk about every time you go on air or that you're talking to every time you go on air. Um, always stick, stick to talking to one person and one person only, so keep it singular. Don't say, if some of you listening would like to, say if you want to. Okay, we only talk to one person. Promote ahead, so we just spoke about it. Promote anything that might be of benefit, of value to your listener ahead. So this will be appointment listening. 
um, if they can win tickets to some amazing big artist uh, uh, show that might be coming to South Africa, you do promote that beforehand because they would like to win those tickets. Okay. If you tell me that something is coming up in a few minutes and I only have 20 minutes until I get to work, I'm going to be quite upset with you if I get to work and you haven't done it yet. But if you tell it, tell me that it's coming up in the next 30 minutes, then I know. Okay. Um, then I know I don't have to hold you against it afterwards. So never promise anything is coming up after the break. That's like saying I'm coming, I'm going away, like I said. So also you must remember that um, you always need to meet someone's expectations. Expectation versus reality, okay? If they're expecting you to say something in the next five minutes, you must say it in the next five minutes. Don't tell me what you think. It's very annoying. Have you ever had someone tell you that you think this, you should like, well, you love this, that kind of a thing. Uh, my immediate reaction is you don't know what I'm thinking. You don't know how I feel about something. So it's annoying when someone tells us what we should feel about something. So don't do it to your listener, okay? Tell me what you like and why you like it. Um, and then let me decide for myself. You can also ask me or you can tell me you hope that I like it as well uh, or whatever. But tell me that you like it and give me the reason. Then sell the dream first before you give the information. So do the why first before you do the how. This is how the biggest uh, companies sell as well. And this is how we tend to buy into things. We buy into things with an emotional reaction, with for the emotiveness, then we want to know the how. So sell this big, amazing thing to me first, um, sell me the dream, and then you give me the information behind it. Because if it's the other way around, if I don't like what's being offered, there's no reason for me to, to listen to anything else, okay? to listen to the technical stuff behind it. So seek an emotional link with the listener. Help me see why I want to win before I hear everything of how I should be doing it. That's with absolutely everything that you do. Always have the why first. Then have a roadmap. Understand how your story fits together. How are you starting out? What is your middle? What is your crumbs? What is your payoff? Um, so the end. Um, then the how is what is your blackout of your link? Okay, understand how all your elements fit together. Then know how to edit phone calls. Why is it important? Because um, you might be doing calls prior to actually putting people on air. It might be a lot of waffling and a lot of emming and eyeing. Or hi, how are you? Good thanks in yourself. No, I'm great, thank you. Oh, I'm such a fan of your show. It's so amazing to finally hear your voice in person. Whatever. All of that is unnecessary. The listener doesn't care about any of that. So you cut all of that out. Okay, you only keep the important parts. Um, so it's impo important that you know how to edit for yourself because sometimes you might only have five minutes in between um, to edit something in and it's really easy to do. So you should be learning how to edit on Logic Pro um, at Boston or alternatively, you can use like Adobe uh, Adobe Edition, that's extremely easy to utilize as well. So we do get a lot of very easy editing programs. Then as much as we have formatics, there are certain formatics for callers to use, okay? Um, so there are things that you would say, like they shouldn't be swearing on air, et cetera. Um, but also you will identify each caller by their name and the place. And after they make their, poip, uh, their point, you give a brief acknowledgement and thank them for their call. Um, so the reason we do this is so that listeners don't feel embarrassed or humiliated and afraid to call in again. Uh, reset the stage. So every couple of minutes, uh, briefly reset what you are talking about. Um, because if the listener can't quickly get what's going on, they might choose to leave to another station. Right. Because if I tune in, I don't want to be confused with what is going on. I want to have an idea of what is happening on air. And then break that habit of taking a break. Like I've said, don't throw away a single minute of your airtime, okay? Even if your station requests that you give a standard introduction to other elements, the mark of a professional 
is the ability to make every word count. So don't use the word break, please. We are never breaking away. Stay away from that as well. Don't panic if you need a moment. What is worse? Listening to radio and hearing someone who is all over the place, just simply babbling and you can figure out they're simply talking to talk right now because they don't want dead air because that's what we were told in, uh, taught in the olden days of radio. We were taught that um, no matter what, never have dead air, okay? Um, so is that better or is it better to simply have silence while you gather your thoughts and to give you a quick breather before you carry on? The moment of silence would be better, okay? Because what happens when we hear silence on air? We immediately focus on the station, yes, and we will go, oh, I wonder what happened there. But once you start talking again, we're not going to think twice about it as a listener. We're just going to carry on. Whereas if you are rambling, we're going to go, sheesh, what is up with this presenter? Okay, not a great presenter. So you don't want that. Don't panic, panic if you need a moment. Take that moment. Your listeners will understand and they aren't going to uh, think about it twice when you come back. Content plus formatics equals ratings. So before each break, remember to tease what is coming up or to reset your talkable topic or engaging question. Then involve your audience. Use a cliffhanger to keep them coming back for more. So hook them, okay? Uh, give a little bit of information, but not enough that they will know how this will uh, conclude, okay? So leave them hanging so that they come back uh, to your next link. Um, after each break, uh, reset your topic and your, re your reset should include your name, your dial position, your topic, your phone number, and a time check if it's relevant. Okay. So that is performance and formatics. It's a lot. It's a lot to remember and to take in. Um, very important and necessary content though. So radio communication utilizes theater of the mind and the people on the radio must talk in pictures. So you must use descriptive language, active descriptive language, emotive, okay? The same principle applies to all material written and produced for on-air purposes. When you listen to the radio, you will notice there's talent that sounds spontaneous and natural and easy. And then there are talent that seems pained and uncomfortable when things go astray. And they make you feel uneasy um, when you hear them reacting so uncomfortable and all over the place in this situation. Seasoned professional talent always gives the impression that they are in control no matter the situation, okay? Always in control. This is a skill that you can be, that you can learn by practicing all of these elementary performance points. Okay, so you learn how to self-correct. Uh, you learn how to air check yourself. Some talent may view for more formatics as restrictive, but the audiences like structure. They like um, stability. They like knowing who they are listening to, what show they are listening to, what the song was that just played, what is the time. On-air personalities must learn to be creative within the confines of formatics. Okay. Any questions for me? Did you all understand all of that, how it works, how formatics and um, how important formatics and performance is? Okay, I'm going to take that as a yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I at least got one yes. Cool. All right. So then you must um, enjoy the rest of your day. And um, I have also recorded this class along with the previous one. So they will be edited and added to Call Campus. And with that, I'm going to say goodbye.